This is the Web Transcription Service of the Royal Canadian Military Institute. Our Fall 2018 program series began on September 18th with Military History Night, featuring retired RCAF Colonel and lecturer at Wilfrid Laurier University, Patrick Dennis, whose recent book, Reluctant Warriors, has redefined the view of the role of Canadian conscripts in World War I. Well, thank you, and uh, welcome to all of you uh, as well, and a special thank you uh, to Pat for organizing this event uh, this evening. Um, to Jim Lutz, the Vice President of the Board of Directors of the RCMI, and for all of your uh, kind invitation to speak in this forum this evening. I'm, I'm truly honored to be here. Well, for me, the story of Canada's reluctant warriors is, in fact, the culmination of an incredible journey that began more than a decade ago. Uh, more recently, though, I had the good fortune uh, to be in Louisville, Kentucky this past spring at the annual Society for Military History Conference. And there I presented a short paper on this same subject as part of an international panel on the role of British American and Dominion conscripts in the final year of the Great War. Indeed, I'm happy to note uh, that one of my distinguished colleagues there was Professor Gary Sheffield uh, of Wolverhampton University. Uh, Gary, a much respected uh, First World War historian, is currently researching the role of British conscripts in the Great War. I'm pleased to note that many of his, uh, Gary's preliminary conclusions are, are similar to my own. Later in the spring of this year, I journeyed by car to the west coast of Canada and back on what I call an epic 10,000 kilometer uh, odyssey during which I was able to speak uh, about this controversial subject to Canadians from all walks of life at 18 different uh, locations uh, out west. That said, my goal this evening is to provide this very knowledgeable audience uh, perhaps a more fulsome overview of Canadian conscripts at war. To do so, I'd briefly uh, like to review with you some of the key events uh, that shaped the long journey of these conscripts from Canada's farms factories, uh, sea coasts, and forests to all the major battlefields of the Canadian Corps in 1918. Secondly, I'd like to offer some new evidence of the battlefield contribution made by these men during the Hundred Days campaign that saw the end of the Great War. Evidence that challenges many of, the Can of Canada's enduring myths about these conscripts. In this context, uh, it's fairly safe to say, I think, that for over a century now, most historical references to Canadian conscripts at war have either been muted, have been negative, or the subject has been neglected altogether. In fact, what has been written is a key part of Canada's mythology of the First World War, something I'll talk about further in a moment. But first, I'd like to share with you a bit of background on how my own research on Canadian conscripts began, along with the main issues and myths that I studied concerning these soldiers, uh, the extent of their contribution to the Canadian Corps in 1918, and follow, finally offer you some general conclusions. Beyond that, of course, I would encourage you to buy my book and discover for yourself a unique chapter in Canadian military history. Actually, a chapter in Canadian history writ large uh, with which, to my knowledge, has never been publicly documented before. As for the book's striking cover that you see here, it seems uh, to capture at a glance some fundamental aspects of basic infantry training. Apart from the obvious camaraderie uh, of this group, this photo shows six young lads in basic training, uh, infantry training at Seaford Camp in the United Kingdom. One is giving uh, his friend uh, to the right, a uh, haircut. The next fella is, is shining his boots. Uh, the fellow beside him is mending his clothes with the mending kit that we were all issued in basic training. Uh, and the fellow on the far right with a cigarette in his mouth is cleaning his uh, Lee Enfield rifle. The chap at the back in full dress uniform is probably the duty corporal. This photo uh, was given to me uh, courtesy of Doreen Williamson of Scarborough, Ontario, 
and found its way as a cover of my book. It's been digitized by the University of British Columbia Press, and I think it's a wonderful uh, way of depicting these young men uh, on the eve of, of something that they had no idea about. Sadly, um, the fellow third from the life, uh, left, Russell Crary, uh, was killed in action um, at the Battle of Iwi in, uh, on the 11th of October, 1918. Well then, at the end of my presentation, my hope is that you'll be left with at least three major points about Canadian conscripts in the Great War. First, contrary to popular mythology, uh, the role played by these conscripts during the Hundred Days in 1918. Second, a new perspective regarding the decision-making of General Curry and his subordinate commanders with respect to the employment of reinforcements and especially Canadian conscripts during the Hundred Days. And third, why in general these reluctant warriors should not be judged as they have been judged for nearly a century as slackers, shirkers, malingerers, and cowards. Indeed, it is on this latter point that I would like to begin with a quote from the last stanza of Lieutenant Siegfried Sassoon's First World War poem, Conscripts. But the kind common ones that I despised Hardly a man of them I'd count as a friend. What stubborn-hearted virtues they disguised. They stood and played the hero to the end, and won gold and silver medals bright with bars, and marched resplendent home with crowns and stars. As it turned out, this poem has a lot of resonance for Canadian conscripts. Here it is worth recalling, though, that the British began the war with the firm belief that only volunteers would be sent to fight. As most of you are aware, though, so too did New Zealand, Canada, and even Newfoundland, all of which later passed military service bills. More remarkably still, perhaps, like Sassoon, Brits and Canadians alike soon learned that, in general, conscripts on the battlefield were no different than their volunteer comrades. Fast forward 52 years to when my own interest in conscripts began during my college days and where I first met American draftees who had served in Vietnam and were then attending university in Canada on the GI Bill. Many years later, I worked with other conscripts from NATO nations in Europe, and then during my three-year tour as the defense attaché in Israel, I met quite a few conscripts, men and women alike. The picture in the top right is a, is a conscript uh, from Norway. But my personal interest in this subject is somewhat more of a recent phenomenon. Indeed, the seeds for my research were basically sown over 11 years ago when my father, a volunteer with the Royal Canadian Air Force in the Second World War, and one who had been wounded but had survived a full tour of bombing operations with the Royal Air Force, handed over to me a handful of letters that his own father had written home from the Western Front. Essentially, Dad wanted me to take these letters for safekeeping, and so I did, reluctantly, of course. But two months later, when Dad suddenly passed away, I instantly recalled this special moment and realized that, in a way, a symbolic family torch had been passed. Then, less than one year later, I attended what, for me, was a life-changing military symposium in Windsor, Ontario. There, the keynote speaker, not Nick Lloyd, the author of this wonderful 2013 history on the left, spoke to us about Canada and the Hundred Days. Now, having learned from my grandfather's letters and from, my, and from official military records that he had been conscripted into the Canadian Army in early January 1918, I took the opportunity during the question and answer period to ask the speaker what role he thought that conscripts had played in the Canadian Corps during the Hundred Days. The speaker reflected for a moment, then answered simply that based on his research, conscripts had arrived too late and in insufficient numbers to make any significant difference whatsoever to the Canadian Corps in 1918. Well, to say the very least, I was both surprised and disappointed by this assessment, but accepted it and waited until afterwards to ask two follow-up questions. First, I told the speaker that my grandfather, Private Hilaire Dennis, had arrived in France in early June 1918, 
and that he had joined his unit in the field, the 18th Battalion Western Ontario Regiment, in the early hours of 13 August at Amiens, or only five days after the so-called Hundred Days had commenced. Now it was the speaker's turn to be surprised. In fact, he appeared to be quite astonished and asked me whether I had proof of this, which of course I did. I then asked him whether the total of 24,000 conscripts who had supposedly served in France was not indeed a significant number. The speaker replied quite bluntly that it was not, citing the fact that over 600,000 men and women had served in the Canadian Expeditionary Force and therefore 24,000 hardly constituted a significant number. And there, I'm afraid, our most dissatisfying exchange abruptly ended. Now, most people are understandably confused by this photo you see in front of you. In England, my grandfather went up to the Big Smoke, London, to have his portrait taken, and perhaps with a somewhat devilish sense of humor, chose to pose in the uniform of an American soldier. But young Hilaire may be forgiven for this charade, because he was in fact born in Bristol, Rhode Island. Indeed, you may view this photo in the home front exhibit at the Canadian War Museum in Ottawa, where it is now on permanent display. But coming back to the reply of the guest speaker, my immediate impression was that there was a bit more to this story. Indeed, I then began to study the subject in depth, and in the course of my research, apart from learning some surprising and interesting details about my grandfather's wartime service, I was also confronted time and again with some rather troubling questions about the role of Canadian conscripts in general. In particular, I noted a recurring impression that for some unknown reason, the story of Canadian conscripts had never been fully told, and certainly not in the same way that memoirs by many soldiers had revealed the combat role played by volunteers. But here I should quickly note that the sample size for my initial research had been just one conscript. Private Hilaire Dennis, who I might add, was severely wounded near Arras on the 28th of August, exactly 100 years and three weeks ago today. Nevertheless, my subsequent research revealed that on the same day that Hilaire was conscripted, so too was his first cousin, Private Leo Dennis, regimental number 3130876. Leo's surname was actually Denis but it was anglicized on his attestation paper. That said, upon completion of his training in England, Leo was not sent to the 18th Battalion like Hilaire, but to the 1st Battalion. Moreover, Leo did not survive the war. He was killed in action near saint cour north of Cambrai, on 1 October 1918. His remains were never fully recovered, and therefore his name is engraved on the National Memorial at Vimy. Well, Shortly after uncovering the details of Leo's demise, I then made an even more startling discovery when I learned that I had two other cousins who had also been conscripted, Privates William Denny Casa and Theodore Theodore Casa, both of whom later served with the 47th Battalion. Private Denny Casa had also sailed to England aboard the SS Grampian in early February 1918 along with his brother Theodore, Hilaire, and Leo. Again, the fates were not too kind. He too fell in battle, killed in action at the Drocourt Cayot line on 2 September 1918, or day 26 of the 100 day campaign. Like Leo, Denny's body was not recovered either, so his sacrifice is also commemorated at Vimy. Finally, there was Denny's older brother, Theodore. Tragically, it would be just over three weeks later that he, too, would be killed in action. Falling in battle at Bourlon Wood on 27 September 1918, or day 50 of the 100 days. Now, at this point in my research, my sample size was only four, albeit all blood relatives, one who had been severely wounded, three who had been killed in action. So it was in this rather sobering context that I came back to the earlier observation about how conscripts, had arrived at the front too late and in insufficient numbers. Indeed, I now felt quite strongly that given four conscripts and four casualties in just one family tree, this subject really did warrant some more intensive research. That research resulted in an article, as Pat mentioned, on this subject, uh, which I published in the Canadian Military History Journal, after which 
Dr. Tim Cook, who I'm sure most of you are familiar with, encouraged me uh, to expand my research and to write a book. My wife, Wendy, has yet to forgive Tim for that advice. <laughs> now, as mentioned earlier, though, this expanded study quickly revealed some other rather troubling aspects about the overall historiography of Canadian conscripts, not to mention several myths about conscripts that had seemingly acquired a life of their own, many of which endure to this very day. But before discussing these myths, permit me for a moment to review with you some of the principal and perhaps better known markers on the road to conscription in Canada. First, all major European nations except Great Britain practiced some level of conscription. Therefore, these nations had on call a large force of trained soldiers who could be quickly mobilized in the event of war, and that's exactly what happened in the summer of 1914. Indeed, many scholars have argued that the mobilization of a nation's citizen army was itself then considered an act of war. Consequently, when Austria-Hungary mobilized, Russia mobilized. When Russia mobilized, Germany mobilized. And when Germany mobilized, France mobilized. Pretty soon, millions of conscripts were taking up arms, but to what end, few of them hardly knew. But having said all that, to be a conscript in Europe in 1914 did not carry anywhere near the military or social stigma that young British or Canadian conscripts would soon experience. Conscription itself for the Europeans was simply a fact of life the duty of every able-bodied male citizen. As for Great Britain, it would pride itself on its small, well-trained but well-led army, volunteer army, at least until January 1916 when it passed the first of five military service bills. Significantly, some data analysis reveals that more men were conscripted into the United Kingdom than were voluntarily enlisted into the British Expeditionary Force. In this context, one might well imagine that prior to the British Parliament's approval of conscription, the pressures to join up in the United Kingdom were intense, to say the least. Evidence of some of these pressures is illustrated in these two recruiting posters. Pardon me. <clears throat> that said, even after the war was won, the British would always distinguish between those who volunteered for Lord Kitchener's armies and those who had been conscripted. And the key dividing line for that bit of discrimination was the Battle of the Somme in July 1916, the last major battle fought by the predominantly British Army, predominantly volunteer British Army. Dr. Alana Battelle's uh, groundbreaking book on British conscripts, Lost Legions, of the Great War, now retitled as Forgotten Men of the Great War, describes in detail the rationale for this dividing line, as well as the many myths that this divide served to perpetuate. Battelle concluded that the biggest myth of all was the myth of participation. In this respect, Battelle also points out that in 1964, when the BBC was doing a 50th anniversary special on the Great War, only those who had served up to the end of 1915 were invited to be interviewed for the program. In retrospect, this seems to have been a somewhat clumsy and ill-considered attempt to marginalize the contribution of what eventually became a force of nearly two million men who were called to the colors over the last three years of the war. Hence, the myth of participation, wherein the public's perceptions of the war were shaped by the volunteers who came forward before 1916 and not by any of the conscripts who were called to the colors in January 1916, nearly three years before the war ended. Eventually, Canada too embraced conscription, albeit much later than the mother country. The reasons for this are quite complex, but essentially break down as follows. At the start of the war, then Colonel Sam Hughes on our left, the Minister of Militia, was unequivocal on this subject. Volunteers only, he demanded. Indeed, for the first year of the war, married men were not allowed to volunteer without their wives' permission. But for any of you who perhaps wish to know more about this, shall we say, mercurial character, I'd highly recommend Tim Cook's 2010 study, The Madman and the Butcher. On the right, Prime Minister Sir Robert Borden 
uh, I think it's useful to recall that he gave a speech to the Canadian Club in Halifax in December 1914 where he solemnly declared, quote, there has not been, there will not be compulsion or conscription. To be fair though, it is equal worth noting that less than five months into the war, not only did the Canadian Expeditionary, consist, Canadian Expeditionary Force consist primarily of just one infantry division, not four, the Canadians had not yet been bloodied in battle. As this slide shows though, we know that just over 20 months later, the Canadian Expeditionary Force was four infantry divisions strong, not to mention all the cavalry and combat support forces attached to the Canadian Corps and elsewhere in the British Expeditionary Force and in the vast training and administrative establishment in England. But then to make the manpower situation even more challenging, Borden complicated matters at the end of 1915 when he offered a total of 500,000 men for service in the British Expeditionary Force. Within a year, though, monthly recruiting had reached the lowest levels of the war so far, and talk of conscription uh, began to become a steady refrain throughout the Dominion. Not surprisingly, then, as had been the case in Britain, pressures to join the CEF began to take various forms, some of which were subtle, others more direct, and still others which were quite aggressive. In addition, civilian recruiting leagues sprung up across the country and began to implement aggressive programs to enlist so-called slackers. And it became common practice for women to pin a white feather of cowardice on the jacket of any young man not in uniform. Indeed, for more on these formidable public pressures to enlist, I would strongly recommend both Jim Blanchard's Winnipeg's Great War, A City Comes of Age, published by the University of Manitoba Press, and Ian Miller's uh, our Glory and Our Grief, Trontonians, and The Great War, uh, published by UTP Press. <clears throat> now then, what some historians have asserted uh, was only a perceived troop shortage reached its climax in 1917. Gordon um, traveled to England to attend the Imperial War Conference, and in April, the United States entered the war. That same weekend, the Canadian Corps uh, made their assault at Vimy Ridge in what Tim Cook has described as the single bloodiest day of the entire war for the Canadian Corps. In fact, by this time in the war, the Canadian Corps had lost nearly 40,000 dead and 100,000 wounded. But to put those numbers in contemporary perspective, they would be equivalent today to nearly 200,000 Canadian dead and a half a million wounded. Meanwhile, the U.S. Congress passed its own Selective Service Act on the 28th of April, uh, which initially applied to all men aged 21 to 30, but eventually included those aged 18 to 45. Finally, as Prime Minister Borden sailed home from Britain in early May, only Canada and Australia remained as the last major combatants not to have invoked conscription for overseas service. But here it's worth noting as well that contrary to popular belief, Australia did indeed have conscription, compulsory military service in the First World War. That law had been enacted in 1911, but was applicable for home defense only. Subsequently, a plebiscite to expand this legislation to include overseas service was narrowly defeated in October 1916, and then a second more decisively so in December 1917. Nonetheless, given that Canada had sustained more than 10,000 casualties at Vimy Ridge, coupled with a steep year-long decline in enlistment rates, Borden was forced to make a major reassessment of Canada's military manpower calculations. Indeed, with both of these sober and painful realities in mind, and only a few days after his return uh, to Canada, Borden announced in Parliament the plans for his party to conscript up to 100,000 men. Shortly thereafter, Borden's government tabled for discussion when the most divisive um, pieces of legislation in Canadian history, the Military Service Act of 1917. Passage of this extremely controversial bill took about two months, but the Governor General did not sign it into law until the 29th of August 1917. Even then, however, unlike the British, Borden did not call out the first class of conscripts right away. Instead, he prorogued Parliament, dissolved his cabinet, and spent a month or so forming a coalition government. 
Here I should add the draft age Canadian population was divided into six classes encompassing all men, single and married, ages 20 to 45. As for the first class of conscripts, they were single men and widowers without children ages 20 to 34, the only class that was actually called to the colors. Next, on Monday, 11 September 1917, the government published an explanatory announcement in all major Canadian newspapers indicating that reinforcements are immediately required and declaring that, quote, resistance to enforcement of the act by word of act must and will be repressed. Potential conscripts were also notified that they may apply for exemption from military service. Specifically, conditional exemptions would be considered for those who were doing work in the national interest, like farmers, railroad workers, munition workers. Needless to say, though, this latter provision of the Military Service Act had great potential at the very outset to derail the entire process. Then only a month later, on Saturday, 13 October 1917, a historic event took place in Canada. A royal proclamation was published in all major newspapers and published in most public places. This proclamation called upon all men in the first class to report for military service, essentially to register uh, for, uh, for service and undergo on a medical exam, or otherwise apply for exemption from service, a first in Canadian history. In addition, the proclamation spelled out some stark details, specifically potential conscripts, also known as our loving subjects, were, quote, forewarned and admonished that anyone who without reasonable excuse fails to report shall thereby commit an offense for which he shall be liable on summary conviction to imprisonment for any term not exceeding five years with hard labor, unquote. Thus, for those young Canadians not granted an exemption, the law was now clear. Present yourself for military service or be prepared to go to jail. The next step in, for Borden's union government uh, was a national election, uh, the main purpose of which was to secure the approval of the Canadian people not only for conscription, but ostensibly to send conscripts overseas to fight. As can be seen by these posters, it was a bitterly fought contest. As professors Desmond Morton and Jack Granitstein once pointed out, it was arguably the most corrupt election in Canadian history. Nonetheless, soldiers and citizens alike endorsed conscription and overwhelmingly endorsed Borden's union government, giving him 153 to Sir Wilfrid Laurier's 82. Thus, armed with the requisite public support, Borden next put the conscription apparatus into full motion, and the first conscripts were ordered to report for service on 3 January 1918. As for my grandfather Hilaire, a streetcar conductor in Windsor, Ontario, he was ordered to report on 8 January and was attested at the 1st Depot Battalion in London on that date. I found this notice in his personal effects, a stark reminder of the consequences of not reporting as ordered. One final note here on the politics of conscription, which was not a major focus of reluctant warriors. As most of you are aware, among Canada's preeminent authorities on that subject is Dr. Jack Granistein. He, along with another expert, Professor Serge Durflinger, have publicly debated the necessity of conscription. Indeed, Professor Durflinger's uh, paper on the consequences of Vimy, published last year in Delaney and Gardner's Turning Point, is a must-read in my view. But not to be overlooked is the scholarly research on this subject published last year by Professors Patrice Dutil and David McKenzie. Uh, of Ryerson University. In this respect, I can highly recommend their new book, Embattled Nation, Canada's Wartime Election of 1917. All of this brings me back, though, to the subject of myth in Canadian conscripts. Myth essentially being a widely held but false belief or idea. Perhaps Jonathan Vance's uh, analysis best describes the impact of myth with respect to Canada and the Great War. Here I would add that half-truths seem to be the principal characteristic of most historiography of Canadian conscripts. Likewise, Vance suggests that this remembrance of the Great War sometimes bore little re 
resemblance to its actualities. Here, a strong argument can be made that what the general Canadian public knew then, or still today, about the role of Canadian conscripts also bears little resemblance to its actualities. In this respect, I'd like to highlight now a few key quotes about Canadian conscripts drawn from books and articles published by Canadian historians over the past uh, half century or so. In doing so, it is certainly not my intent to disparage the work of these historians, but simply to identify several key myths which have subsequent, subsequently shaped Canada's historical narrative on this controversial subject. Indeed, collectively, these quotes are part and parcel of Canada's own myth and memory of the Great War. Here I believe it's noteworthy as well that the prefix only is almost always used with the number 24,000, a misleading diminutive uh, to say the least, which belies the fact that this number is equivalent to the total line infantry in two full infantry divisions. That said, with respect to conscripts being vital if the war had extended into 1919, this is a half-truth. The subtle implication being that conscripts were not vital in 1918 as well. But before addressing these myths further, first I'd also like to share some relevant statistics, uh, which I've long grouped under the rubric, lies, damn lies, and conscripts. As shown here, conscripts were 20% of the overall recruitment in the Canadian Expeditionary Force while it appears at first glance that they were about 11% of the Canadian personnel overseas. However, it's important to note here that the number 236,000 at line four represents the total enlisted infantry in France and Belgium from December 1914 to November 1918, whereas the number of conscripts, 97% of whom were infantry, served in France and Belgium between April and November 1918 alone. So let's look at these numbers a little more closely. When one drills down to the sharp end and to those soldiers actually poised on the fire step at the start of the barrage, the total small arms firepower of the Canadian court takes on an entirely new dimension. Here the manpower focuses on trench strength, which is what conscripts became a crucial and integral part of as soon as they arrived at the front during the 100 days. In this respect, my research reveals that the trench strength percentage of conscripts varied in each battalion, but generally increased from April to November 1918. And by the armistice, most infantry battalions were at 30%, some were at nearly 50%. Here I would also add that evidence overwhelmingly indicates that not very long after reaching the horse lines, conscripts were led quickly to the front line and immediately became a key part of the battalion's overall trench strength, the fate of all newcomers. Next, part of the myth about limited or even non-participation by conscripts in the 100 Days campaign is the notion that they arrived too late. Starting with the Great Battle of Amiens, where conscripts were allegedly absent. So what can be said about this myth? The first clue that conscripts were engaged in battle well before the worst fighting was over is the fact that Private George Alsop of the 18th Battalion was killed in action near Nouvelle Vitasse, just southeast of Arras, over eight full weeks before the start of the Hundred Days. The second clue is this list of fatal conscript casualties, draftees who fell at the Battle of Amiens. Especially those examples shown here were killed on the very first day of the Hundred Days campaign. They include Private Duart Kier, a 23-year-old stove monitor, and Private Gus Izzo, a 22-year-old shoe repairman, both from Toronto. The third clue are these examples of conscripts who fell later at Amiens in an action at Arras starting on 26 August, or day 19, of the 100 days. 
Indeed, this sample list includes conscripts from 18 different infantry battalions and one from the 2nd Division Trench Mortar bat Battery, who all made the supreme sacrifice before Day 20 of the 100-Day Campaign. Next, if this statement about conscripts is true, we would have a hard time reconciling it with the statistical data available on conscripts who fought, for example, with these seven battalions. Here I should note that the typical trench strength of a Canadian infantry battalion on the first day it was committed to battle was between 550 and 600 rifles. So in the case of the 20th, the 21st, and 72nd battalions, it appears that each company had the equivalent of up to one company of uh, one infantry company of conscripts, 150 men, included in their trench strength. At times, this may have been up to two companies. Indeed, in the case of the 72nd Battalion, almost half of these men became casualties. As for the 20th Battalion, the memory of which is perpetuated by Toronto's own Queen New York Rangers, it received 270 conscripts by the 1st of September. By the end of that month, nearly 68% of these men had been killed or wounded. That said, my research also reveals that conscripts died in every single one of Canada's 48 infantry battalions. They also perished in the machine gun corps, as sappers and engineer battalions, in field artillery units, and with cyclist battalions. In addition, you might also be interested to know that conscripts fell in action with the Fort Garry horse, the Lord Strathcona's horse, and with the Royal Tr Canadian Dragoons, battlefield exploits by the Canadian cavalry that did not make it into my book, unfortunately, but hopefully will be publicly documented in the next year. Next, with respect to the slanderous accusation that conscripts were cowards, well, as it turned out, quite a few of them were decorated, decorated for conspicuous bravery, but not nearly as many, in my view, as their numbers at the front may have warranted. These men most likely acted very bravely indeed, though, inasmuch as recognition for their courage in battle must have come somewhat reluctantly, which also seems to make the recognized achievements on the battlefield even more impressive. Private Orloff Whitney, for example, was originally from Orillia. This 29-year-old machinist who lived on Strathcona Street in East York, a house that still stands today in Toronto, won a military medal for gallantry, possibly for his actions at the Battle for the Drocourt Carat Line on 2 September, or at Canel du Nord on 27 September, the day he was wounded in the leg by gunfire. As for Private Williard Woodcock from Dwight in Northern Ontario, on Sunday, 29 September 1918, he volunteered with two others and succeeded in working forward and closing in on an enemy gun crew, bombing them out and killing the crew. For his, quote, fine courage and determination under fire, Woodcock was awarded the Distinguished Conduct Medal, which, as many of you are aware, was the Empire's second highest award for gallantry. Sadly, Woodcock's younger brother, John, also a conscript with 116th Battalion, uh, the Umpty Umps, would be killed in action two days later. And so with this overview of Canadian conscripts at war in 1918, I'd now like to offer some general conclusions, the details of which, as I mentioned earlier, can be found in Reluctant Warriors. First, as an aside though, this wonderful portrait is the Leader Brothers, Herbert on the left and Eden on the right, two farmers of the Mormon faith from Saugeen Township near Port Elgin, Ontario. They were conscripted in London on the 8th of January 1918, the same day as my grandfather. However, younger brother uh, Herbert on the left sailed for England in late February without Eden, who was not dispatched until August. After more than five months training, Herbert arrived in France on 20 August and was initially assigned to the 1st Battalion. Uh, but a week later, he was reassigned to the 31st Battalion and joined that unit in the field on the 29th of August, 1918. Sadly, six weeks later, Herbert was killed in an important but obscure action at the Battle of Iwi. As for Eden, the war ended before he could complete his basic training and he eventually returned safely home to Canada. But now to my conclusions. In the end, the numbers were significant. Conscription did not come too late. 
MSA men filled the ranks at the start of the Hundred Days before when the worst fighting had just begun. Moreover, the overwhelming evidence is that conscripts who went to war were neither slackers, shirkers, nor were they uh, cowards or malingerers. In short, these men performed quite well in action. But with respect to my first point here, Professor Jack Granitstein once wrote, precisely how many conscripted men saw action remains unclear, and we have no firmer sense, he wrote, of whether these unwilling soldiers performed well in action. Today, that precise number of conscripts who saw action remains a wee bit elusive, but it is within our grasp since the digitization of all First World War personnel files by Library and Archives Canada is now complete. Soon we will know precisely how many conscripts arrived in England and when and how many arrived in France and Belgium, and precisely how many became casualties. As for how well these unwilling soldiers performed in action, that is no longer in doubt. Indeed, the results of my research allow me to confidently conclude the following additional points. Conscription did produce men when they were needed most. It was a classic case of just-in-time delivery. However, the steady flow of conscripts to the front appears to have had a significant impact on Curry's military strategy. That said, without conscripts, I conclude there would not have been a 100 days campaign for the Canadian Corps. Now most scholars will agree that the principal architect of Canada's great victories in the 100 days was the Corps Commander, Lieutenant General Sir Arthur Currie, who's now on this side of me and this side of you. Um, in this respect, early in my research, it also became quite clear that the rapid reinforcement of the Canadian Corps, so meticulously detailed last year in my friend the late Richard Holt's fine book, Filling the Ranks, was crucial to Curry's success. Therefore, I submit that no examination of conscripts at war in 1918 would be complete without an examination of Curry, his subordinate commanders, and their decision making with respect to the employment of reinforcements during the 100 days, including these conscripts. My principal conclusions in this regard, though, are as follows. <clears throat> First, in conducting a singular campaign of near-continuous, large-scale, high-intensity operations, Curry often assumed in the process previously unimaginable risks. Ultimately, in taking those risks, Curry's Canadian Corps sustained record casualties. Second, the key to Curry's strategy was a steady and robust flow of reinforcements, mainly conscripts and BCRM men, British Canadian Recruiting Mission. These are British subjects recruited in the United States. Indeed, for the first time in the war, reinforcements flowed directly to the front line units throughout the offensive, sometimes even as the battle was still underway. However, despite high casualties, Curry repeatedly sent weakened and fatigued formations up against formidable obstacles and determined opponents, thereby violating at least one of his own battlefield principles. Thus, while he was previously known to have sought victory at the lowest possible cost in lives, Curry emerged from the Hundred Days victorious. But as one scholar has, no has noted, and several others seem to concur, Curry appears to have pushed his Canadian Corps too hard. Consequently, the interrelationship between these very high casualty rates, the simultaneous flow of reinforcements to the field and Curry's battlefield momentum all collectively seem to be a clear invitation to additional scholarly research in this area. Nonetheless, in light of this analysis, I conclude that Curry could only maintain the steady battlefield momentum thanks primarily to a near continuous and robust flow of reinforcements, mainly conscripts, something one, only one other commander could do, the American General Jack Pershing. As to the subject of employing extremely tired troops in combat, I leave you with this quote from World War II and Korean War historian S.L.A. Marshall. Finally, one may well ask, why does any of this matter? Well, first of all, the official historical record is incomplete. 
Indeed, thanks to this very sparse history, remarkably few conscripts like Private George Price are known to Canadians, whilst many thousands of other conscripts are either forgotten or are completely unknown. As an aside here, uh, permission to use this uh, photo of Private Price was given to me by his nephew uh, and namesake, Mr. George Barkhouse, who lives in Canning, Nova Scotia. Barkhouse's mother was George Price's sister. <clears throat> in addition, I plan to attend ceremonies marking the 100th anniversary of Price's sacrifice to be held on the 10th of November in ville sur hand Belgium. Uh, as some of you may be aware, uh, this village uh, has a small sh uh, shrine to Price. And since he is featured in the first two pages of my book, I hope to present a copy of Reluctant Warriors to the mayor that day. But again, as to why this should matter, it's equally clear that the official record of Canadian conscripts at war is also inaccurate. In this respect, I am told that amendments to the related websites that speak to Canadian conscripts and the politics of conscription are under review, but this next quote illustrates the scope of the problem. This comes from the Canadian War Museum. Once again, we see the selective use of the adjective only. However, in light of new evidence, elements of that first statement are highly debatable, uh, while the second statement ignores the fact that even more conscripts would have been needed in November 1918 had the war not ended that month. That said, I have no illusions about this rather formidable task. Website updating is but the first step. High school teachers and university professors alike across the country will also need to revise their First World War lesson plans. Indeed, some have written to me to say uh, that they have already started the process, which is very encouraging. But still, it will take at least a generation to amend this narrative. Now then, going back to the impact of conscription in the immediate post-war period, it appears that a lack of information regarding the role of conscripts at war may have directly impacted the elections in 1921, 1925, and 1926. This is another area that I believe warrants additional scholarly research. Likewise, a persuasive argument can be made, and in fact has indeed been made, that this lack of information severely hampered the debate on this issue in the Second World War. For example, the Minister of National Defense in late 1944 uh, was James Leighton Ralston, a commanding officer of the 18th Battalion in the First World War had been wounded four times in battle. Ralston was one of the very few in government who had first-hand knowledge of the value of conscripts during the Hundred Days campaign, but his subsequent support for conscription ultimately cost him his job. For more on these events, though, I draw your attention to Dan Byer's scholarly study entitled Zombie Army, published by UBC Press in 2016. Next, over the past 75 years, the subject of conscripts in the First World War has often been conflated with negative remarks made about these men who were labeled as zombies in the Second World War. The net result is what I refer to as an undercurrent of animus towards conscripts that has now existed in Canadian society for over a century. Indeed, I encountered such resentment early on in my research and many times thereafter. In this respect, though, it seems ironic that despite the fact that the vast majority of draft-age Canadian men did not serve in the Great War, First World War conscripts are still often perceived in a very negative manner. That said, I've also found that when critics of conscripts are presented with further information on the service and sacrifice of draftees who served honorably at the front, there seems to be a general softening of views in this regard. My hope, therefore, is that future historians and indeed all students of the Great War will forge a new narrative about Canadian conscripts. <coughs> Pardon me one that strikes a balance between the sacrifice that these men made on the battlefield and the divisions they created at home through their legitimate opposition to fighting a European war. That, in my, review, in my view, should be the new legacy for these reluctant warriors. <clears throat> Lastly, some scholars suggest that Canada will never again resort to such extreme recruitment measures. The politics of conscription being essentially radioactive. I'm no longer convinced, however. And given the international events of the past year or so, how could it be otherwise?
For those skeptics among us here, however, I would note that six NATO nations currently practice conscription. Eight others have conscription on their legislative shelves as an option to implement immediately as required. In addition, I should also note that Sweden, one of NATO's strongest partner countries, has just reinstituted conscription effective the 1st of January this year for men and women alike. In this regard, as remote as the possibility may be for Canada, do we dare use the word never? That said, I conclude with the following thoughts. In an era when wars are fought by machines, by drones, and by computers, where whole governments are imperiled, and when battle casualties are often but a tiny fraction of those during the two world wars, it's very difficult to imagine a time when these same governments would once again call upon their young men and women to take up arms against their will. But if the history of conflict over the past millennia has taught us anything, it is that the need for men and women to fight for the survival of the state can quickly generate unforeseen manpower requirements and compelling requirements that at another time and at another place might be impossible to imagine. Yet, when faced once more by the crucible of war and by the specter that all might be lost, an old paradigm may be born yet again, the reluctant warriors. Thank you. Yes, the picture, by the way, is of the uh, of the RMS Olympic, a ship that brought my grandfather home um, uh, from Europe in uh, January 1919. It was painted by Sir Arthur uh, Lismer. Um, I was giving a talk in uh, in uh, out west, and I was stunned to see this painting on the wall uh, at the museum in, in Calgary the military museums of, of Calgary, the original, the original uh, photo. Uh, so yes, I'd be happy to take some of your questions, please. Hi. Okay. Um, if I've got it right, the DCRM, where the British Canadian recruits Re that Re were recruited from the States? They were British subjects, Canadians, Brits, uh, in the United States. They so started, yeah. So you had said your grandfather was living in Rhode Island, but he had been one of them? No. No, he was living in, uh, this is an interesting thing, I'm not sure, this couldn't happen today, I could say it couldn't happen today, but there were so many Americans, and I document them in my book, who were working in Canada, uh, what determined whether or not you could be conscripted in Canada was where you were living on the, on the 4th of October, or 4th of August 1914, and if you were American working a farm out in, in uh, Moose Jaw, Saskatchewan, they could conscript you. Uh, it was amazing. My grandfather was born in Rhode Island, but he was he was working as a streetcar conductor in Windsor when he was uh, conscripted. That said, the British Canadian recruiting mission uh, provided a lot of uh, troops in 1918 as well that complemented, not nearly as many as uh, as was once thought. The the dominant uh, reinforcement force was conscripts in in 1918. Uh, one one of your, our colleagues asked about the the fifth division, which was formed in England at the time and was disbanded in February of 1918. It provided 7,000 infantry uh, to the Canadian Corps, which was just recuperating after the devastating losses of, of Vimy, Hill 70, and Passchendaele. Uh, but that 7,000 men were essentially eaten up over just from normal attrition of 100, uh, they, were, they were treating about 100 men a day. So by June of 1918, those 7,000 would have been eaten up just in normal attrition. So then the, the conscripts started arriving in late April 1918 and May and June. Yes, yes. That's true. Yeah, it's true. I, I'm, um, uh, other people have asked me whether or not I'm a pro-conscriptionist. I'm not, and I'm, uh, you probably didn't draw that conclusion from this, this lecture. I'm an ex-military. I'm a volunteer. My father was a volunteer. Uh, 
I believe in a volunteer. I, mean, I, I believe in national service. I, I, I guess I, I believe that young people uh, should do something for, for their country. And when I was serving in Germany, it was interesting because they were, uh, uh, they were given an option whether or not to, to go into the army uh, or do some national service, like working as an orderly in a hospital or something like that. So they actually had the, had the option. Uh, but it invests young people with ownership in the great uh, Canadian uh, adventure that we're all on. And, and I think that would be a good idea. I don't know how you could possibly implement it. It's an off-topic su subject, but it's different from conscription. Yes, sir? Was there any distinction between That's a good question. Is there any a distinction between conscription in Ke Quebec and the rest of Canada? Conscription was applied uh, across the country. The most vociferous uh, opposition, as we've seen in newspaper accounts, uh, was in Quebec. But as I point out in my book, conscription was opposed uh, by f farmers out west, by forestry workers uh, uh, across the country, by fishermen down east. Conscription was opposed across the country. It's surprising that it, it, uh, uh, it, was, it succeeded, or that the Unionist government was elected, but it was a, a pretty corrupt election. All the, uh, the histories that have been written on the subject explain uh, how that happened. But the people in Quebec uh, had, uh, were not invited to participate in the war. They didn't form any French-speaking battalions. Uh, there was uh, one thing I think uh, one uncomfortable uh, reality about Canada in 1914 is, is Canada was a deeply racist country in 1914. And we were divided by uh, class and race. And there was great animosity even then, before the war, between English and French Canadians. And the war exacerbated those uh, tensions. People in Quebec, uh, interesting enough, I mean, one of the, the things that's emerged most recently is that more French Canadians served in the Canadian Expeditionary Force than has previously been uh, uh, accredited, um, which is interesting because a lot of French Canadians moved out west. I mean, I, I stumbled on a village in British Columbia that was entirely French Canadian. Um, so there were a lot of French Canadians that served uh, in the Canadian Expeditionary Force that weren't recruited in England. And what they calculated all the statistics was based on your province of, uh, of recruitment. And of course, the numbers were really low. The other interesting thing about people in Quebec was they married younger. And the first class of conscripts were uh, single and uh, married men who were uh, widowers with no children. So um, statistically, there were fewer of them, even though they were the largest populous uh, province at the time, uh, than certainly in other, other provinces. But resentment uh, to conscription was Canada-wide. And you'll see that, bits and pieces of that in different accounts. But I, 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 I point that out in, in my book. <laughs> there was another question. Yes, sir. Uh, you Yeah, there are two questions there about uh, whether or not if you if you came home, uh, if you were there last, did you come home last? If you were there first, did you come home first? That's how the Australians did it. If you were first overseas, you were first home. And the Canadian uh, at, at the basic levels wanted to do that. Curry didn't want to do that. He wanted to repatriate the Corps um, as units, as, as, as uh, complete units for discipline purposes in his view. And uh, the problem with that was, at the end of the war, the 1st and 2nd Division were sent to Germany as occupation forces. And they were the first two divisions over. So now what do you do with 3rd and 4th Division? There's all these ships waiting to take soldiers over. And there was a lot of resentment to the fact that, that there were some conscripts, uh, the war was over, and, and Ottawa issued a directive saying, fill those spots on the ship with whoever's available to go. So if you were in training, as, as uh, one of the leader brothers, the younger or the older leader brother was, they put you on a ship and sent you home. In my grandfather's case, he was still recovering from a very severe, uh, he had been machine gunned nearly to death at Arras and was still recovering from that. And wounded men did not get a priority, but he, he didn't apologize to anybody that he was on that ship 
1919. But Canada, uh, and that created a lot of resentment. And there were you can read about all the riots that occurred in England uh, uh, at the time because of that. And your second question had to do with. Uh, Borden had agreed to send uh, um, a brigade of Canadian troops to Vladivostok uh, in, uh, in June of 1918. Uh, they didn't end up going until Christmas Eve. They set sail from, uh, from Victoria. And most of the soldiers, the infantry soldiers, were conscripts. Um, and of course, the problem with that was conscription was supposed to, to, to uh, uh, bring on board additional forces necessary to keep the Corps intact till the end of the war. But the war was over and the Corps was breaking up and yet they were still sending these soldiers over. So there was a riot in Victoria that I, I, I document in, in my book as well. Um, there were some French Canadians involved which created, uh, you know, perpetuated this myth about French Canadians be, being in, in opposition to this. And so uh, there were several French Canadian soldiers who actually uh, died of disease. There were none killed in combat. They never engaged in combat in, in Russia. But they were sent there and uh, they brought them back uh, within about four months, five months, uh, the force was returned uh, to Canada. But it did create a lot of uh, division. But there were no soldiers. There were some soldiers who'd been to France um, and had come back to Canada who were senior NCOs then that accompanied the uh, Canadian Siberian Expeditionary Force, it was called, uh, to Vladivostok. Um, uh, in, in the, I wasn't sure how many made it to Murmansk either. Uh, there was about 4,500. It was a brigade, mm -hmm. yeah, of infantry alone. Yeah, but there were gunners and uh, support people as well. Uh, yes, sir? Was there reluctance among the Ukrainian population of the West to conscription? The, um, uh, was there a reluctance to, uh, for example, among the Ukrainian population out west uh, to, to, to participate? Uh, one of the things that Borden was fearful of was that the immigrant community out west would vote against uh, conscription. And so one of the laws he passed um, in September of 1918 was uh, that pre prevented uh, anyone who had immigrated to Canada after... Um, 1902 to vote, so they, those people were disenfranchised, um, and in particular they worried about uh, some of the Ukrainians. But you have to recall the Ukraine was part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and so many of those Ukrainians had been um, incarcerated in camps out west. As a matter of fact, there's a traveling display that's been going across Canada the last uh, couple of years, documenting uh, the camps they, they sent the Ukrainians. Uh, two. Uh, with the two laws that were passed that uh, you know, created all this election gerrymandering in, in uh, September 1918 was the Military Voters Act, which enfranchised uh, any British subject, male or female. Uh, and that was the first time that in Canada where women had uh, the chance to vote at the federal level. They had already voted uh, in the provincial level in, 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 uh, um, in Alberta. Uh, the other thing that act allowed them to do was to allow the soldiers' vote to be assigned to any writing that uh, the party wanted it assigned to. So if, if you didn't know, if you were from um, Toronto, York, East York, and, uh, but you didn't know where you were voting for, they could take your vote and assign it to uh, Borden's writing in Nova Scotia. And it did, it did uh, change the uh, results of the election. But, uh, yeah, it was gerrymandering. The other, the other act they passed was the Wartime Elections Act, which, uh, in answer to your question, disenfranchised, disenfranchised all new Canadians uh, from enemy countries who arrived in Canada after 1902. And that, include, of course, included uh, Ukrainians, Poles, or not Poles, because they were part, uh, anybody who was, uh, which is interesting, because Ukrainians, you know, they fought on, on both sides. Yes, sir. 
very well articulated. Those are the games, some of the most deeply entrenched myths by some of the premier historians of our country, Desmond Martin, Jack Ransky, etc. And I know that you have great respect for these historians, but how do you as an author sort of undertake that challenge? I mean, it must have been daunting. Can you tell us only something about that? How you proceeded with that as an well, I quote Desmond Morton in my book, a uh, famous quote he had is, uh, uh, was, evidence has a way of dissolving theories. And I present the evidence. And the evidence that I present is different than what is, has been told to the Canadian public for 100 years. Now, we have the advantage. I didn't have the advantage when I first started off my research to, to be able to tap in uh, to, to files. I, I spent uh, weeks at Library and Archives Canada, and I ordered a lot of files online, um, uh, which, you know, now they're all digitized, so the public has, has access to these files, which weren't available uh, seven or eight years ago. Um, so what I did was I tried to uh, accumulate as much evidence. Uh, well, what I, I, I didn't start, I started with a null hypothesis. I mean, the idea was conscripts arrived too late and in insufficient numbers to create any significant to have any significant difference. What evidence supports that? None. It just kept mounting and mounting. And that's when I, 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 uh, I, I asked uh, the Canadian War Museum and the University of British Columbia whether or not they were interested in having this story told. And they said, yes, write it. Uh, it just it, it took a long time to do that because uh, this was an academic monograph and proof is, is key uh, to the success of any of those uh, endeavors. And, and I think you'll find in Reluctant Warriors the proof, the proof is there. That's why Jack Granistein, uh, Dr. Jack Granistein, agreed to write the foreword to my book and publicly stated that, that he got it wrong. Thank you. This has been another in our series of webcasts produced by the Royal Canadian Military Institute in Toronto as a public educational service. You can find news of upcoming events and links to our webcast archives at www.rcmi.org. On behalf of the RCMI, this is Eric Morse saying goodbye for now and thank you for joining us.